Competitive Pokemon is by and large dominated by the types of Pokemon you'd expect, those with multiple excellent useful stats. This is most easily exemplified by legendaries, mythicals, and pseudo-legendaries, but there are plenty of so-called quote-unquote regular Pokemon that fit the bill just as well. For example, Pokemon like Ferrothorn, Excadrill, or Slowbro aren't legendary, mythical, or pseudo-legendary, but they've been among the best, most consistent Pokemon for multiple generations. Pokemon that succeed in the competitive scene generally have one or two really, really high stats but also have a balanced set of stats across the board. Even something like Kieran Black and its hilariously high 170 base attack are supported by solid bulk, speed, and special attack. But there are some Pokemon who succeed despite not having any of that. But before we get to that, customize your browser like you customize your teams because this video is sponsored by Opera GX. And I'm so glad to be sponsored by them because I switched to Opera from Chrome like two years ago and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And here's the reason I switched. Chrome uses a lot of RAM and Opera GX is known for its GX control feature, which limits the use of your CPU or RAM of your browser. Look at how much Opera uses versus other browsers. That way you can have a bunch of tabs open and not worry Worry about it lagging your games. And trust me, I keep a lot of tabs open when looking up stuff to make videos. Opera GX aims to make browsers way less boring and they accomplish this by having a lot of mods. For example, you want to make it feel like an old Game Boy? Just install the GX Boy theme. It even comes with sound effects. <laughs> You can make it look cozy by choosing the cozy theme, or make it look futuristic with Cyberdeck. There's even community themes like the Gengar one, making your browser spooky like our boy. But, I get it. It's a hassle to have to transfer over all of your data from your old browser. Except when it's not, use Opera GX's quick import tool and import all your browser history, bookmarks, cookies, you name it, in less than a minute. Also, Opera GX is compatible with every Chrome extension. So get a browser that is literally better at everything by using my link in the description below and download Opera GX for free. So what then is the Quagsire Theorem? Well, it's rarer, but sometimes there are Pokemon that are fixtures in the competitive scene, despite not being very impressive statistically. In fact, they're so unimpressive, the fact that they succeeded can often baffle players. How are they struggling with a Pokemon with a base stat spread more in line with lower tiers, where such Pokemon often reside even temporarily, despite their OU viability? This is one of the things that makes competitive Pokemon so interesting. Though it's not just about the stats, while they are, of course, important, it's about a confluence of factors from typing to ability to move pull and sometimes these come together with such impact that overcome the stats and launch their pokemon to star status why is it named after quagsire one because quagsire is a perfect example of this concept two because quagsire rules which is all the reason anyone should need and then some and there's a third reason which you'll see later today we're exploring pokemon with unimpressive stat spreads using a general guideline of not having any base stats of or higher than base 100 that regardless managed to find heavy competitive success in the higher tiers. We call this the Quagsire Theorem. When it comes to the Pokemon it's surrounded by in the higher tiers, Klefki's stats aren't just lower, they're outright bad. It's a defensive Pokemon with an aggressively underwhelming base 57 HP. Well, fine, the Rotom appliances have even lower HP than that, and they're excellent, but Klefki doesn't have the defensive stats they do. Its base 87 special defense, while decent in its own right, isn't enough to compensate for that low HP. Or so it would seem. Klefki's stats aren't amazing, but they are just good enough in conjunction with its amazing type, superb utility move pull, and prankster ability for Klefki to do what it's supposed to do perfectly. And what exactly did it do? Well, Klefki's most well-known appearance was in XY and Oraz Ubers. It didn't just have a small niche though. It was one of the best, most popular, defining, and important Pokemon in the tier. A tier staple on par with or even ahead of the huge stat legendaries whose image Ubers was created in. Part of what made it so good was that it was entirely unique in the combination of traits it brought to the table. But the most important by far was its ability to reliably answer the single most terrifying Pokemon in the game, Geomancy Xerneas. It switched into all of Xern's unboosted moves quite decently and threatened the sweep ruining Thunder Wave in return. If Xerneas switched out, it would be punished with the spikes Klefki laid down, making its next switch in and setup more difficult. Turning the scariest sweeper around into spikes fodder? Only Klefki could do that. Now Klefki wasn't a hard counter to Xerneas in and of itself. In the event, Xerneas decided to stay in and slug it out, but it didn't need to be. Should Xerneas 
Saturnius attempt that, it still find itself paralyzed and therefore vulnerable to a huge portion of the tier. Especially since after the paralysis, Klefki had the option of chipping it down further with the play rough that was boosted by Xerneas' own fairy aura. The same play rough that prevented substitute Xerneas from avoiding that all-important thunder wave. Alternatively, if the follow-up answer to Xerneas didn't need the extra chip, Klefki could throw down some spikes. Even rest talk Xerneas wouldn't get the job done. That's what Klefki's heal block was for. As if answering Xerneas and laying spikes wasn't enough, Klefki leveraged its resistance laden typing and prankster thunder wave to switch in on and threaten several more of the scariest Pokemon around. Darkrai, Yveltal, Mewtwo, and the Laddie Twins. With the Laddies being especially relevant since they were the most common defoggers around and Klefki spiked in their faces with ease. Klefki's prankster thunder wave could threaten anything, from Mega Gengar to Mega Salamence, and its spikes supported its teammates beautifully, making them even more threatening. This was far and away Klefki's greatest niche, but it had others. It popped up near the end of XYOU to counter Mega Gardevoir, which was shredding the tier with ease, and to lay the spikes which were gaining traction. It also occasionally appeared in Auras, with Magnet Rise and Foul Play turning the tables on a seemingly perfect answer, Excadrill. Finally, even though Gen 7's Prankster nerf meant Klefki could no longer Thunder Wave dark types like Yveltal, and T-Wave itself also got nerfed to 90% accuracy and having the opponent's speed as opposed to its previous 100% and quartering respectively, and there was also an incredible new Steel Fairy type Magirna, Klefki still managed a decent niche in Gen 7 Ubers. Its presence in Gen 6 Ubers though was one of a kind, perfectly illustrating that even in the strongest metagame out there, stats aren't everything. Zatsu may share typing with Lugia, but that's about it. Its outright poor bulk is exacerbated by nasty weaknesses to Stealth Rock and Pursuit, while its offenses aren't exactly noteworthy even in the lower tiers, and its move pool isn't anything to write home about either. However, true to the Quagsire theorem, Zatsu has just the right attributes in just the right places, which it can use to carve out the slightest niche for itself. Its standout trait is of course its Magic Bounce ability. Bouncing back all manner of utility is useful, from status to Leech Seat to Taunt to Phasing, but its primary function is the the blocking of entry hazards, one of the most important components of competitive singles. Being able to deny hazards opens so many possibilities and opportunities in both team building and the battle itself, and nowhere is this on clearer display than Zaltu's most prominent appearance, Gen 5 OU, where it becomes a Sun Team staple. Without hazards, its teammate Dugshire was free to run Focus Sash, while Volcarona was one of the most ludicrously threatening Pokemon around when unimpeded by rocks. Zaltu had no problem completely shutting down the tier spikers Ferrothorn and Skarmory. This was absolutely excellent given how much of Gen 5 OU revolved around spikes. Zatu especially enjoyed facing Pharaoh on raid teams since it almost always be the team's stealth rocker as well. However, Zatu had a problem. Other stealth rockers were far, far more difficult for it to deal with. After all, it was weak to Tyranitar, totally blanked by Heatran, and none too enthused about facing Landorus Therian either. Those were just the bulky rockers too. Something more offensive like Garchomp or Terrakion? Forget it. Zatu didn't need to beat all of these on its own though. What made it so good was the way its traits worked in conjunction with its teammates. Its weaknesses could even be turned into advantages. This was most apparent in the Tyranitar matchup. Sure, Tyranitar dominated Zatu one-on-one -on -one in a nutshell, but with Rocky Helmet, Zatu completely flipped the script. Each time Tyranitar crunched Zatu, it would take significant chip damage. Zatu was just bulky enough to where it could force several crunches with Roost too, and if it managed to get a reflect up, it could even win. Zatu didn't need to beat Tyranitar itself though. Just chip it low enough for its teammate Dugtrio to pick off afterwards, ensuring the weather war was won for the Sun team. It was similarly effective against Heatran. If Heatran ever wanted to actually KO Zatu, it'd be punished with the Dugtrio trap afterwards. Zatu's deceptive bulk meant it was surprisingly adept at taking on Landorus Therian too. Not ironclad, but good enough to allow for leeway in playing against it. And with Rocky Helmet and Nightshade, it could even mess with Garchomp enough for Dugtrio to finish the job. To give an idea of how bulky max defense Zatu was, it was overwhelmingly favored to survive a Terrakion Stone Edge from full health. As a nice side bonus, Zatu also completely countered the massively irritating Brelu. Zatu's hazard blocking was so infuriatingly reliable that it was a major contributing factor to why Sun Teams wound up being broken. If you could beat them with hazards, it's hard to imagine them getting nerfed via bans the way they were repeatedly. Talk about bypassing your low stats effectively. Other than that niche, Gen 5 Uber's teams generally preferred Espeon as a magic bouncer. Far higher speed and offensive capability, but Zatu's axe 
access to U-turn, one of the best moves in the game, also gave it a niche in that tier, which was famously hazard heavy. Furthermore, hyper offense team, so Oraz OU, briefly enjoyed Zatu for both its fast paced hazard blocking and the dual screens it was set, enabling threats like Mega Charizard X with particularly terrifying efficiency. However, Gen 5 OU was where Zatu really shone as a consistently legit part of the metagame, fiercely wrangling as much value as possible out of its low stats any way it could, including sacrificing itself. Nidoking is the only Pokemon on this list with a single base stat over 100, which ordinarily would disqualify it from contention, but we're making an exception because in the generation specified, it doesn't even use that base 102 attack stat. Okay, so it could slot in Focus Punch in Gen 8 for Blissey, but in practice, it usually didn't, on account of wanting several other generally more useful moves. Even if it wanted to mess with Blissey, it generally preferred Taunt, which was a more valuable move overall. So for all intents and purposes, Nidoking was a pure special special attacker and that was just gen 8 anyway in 7 and 6 it never even thought of the move since it just bounced off the evil light chancy that was the preferred special walling blob so we feel justified in needle king's inclusion here what would be a thoroughly underwhelming base 85 special attack stat by OU standards skyrockets into one of the scariest threats around when bolstered by needle king's many other excellent attributes first its move pool is overflowing with outstanding choices it is perfectly poised to crush most walls with its stabs and ice beam Sludge Wave shreds bulky fairies and grasses, while Earth Power tears through steels and Toxapex, and Ice Beam ensures it has zero problems with any ground flying types, walling the two moves. It can bolster this coverage further with Thunderbolt to really lay into waters, or Flamethrower to effortlessly smash the likes of Ferrothor. Both moves ensure it crushes steel flying types too. Its coverage is so good with just stabs and Ice Beam though, that it doesn't even need that last attack. It can delve into utilities such as with the aforementioned Taunt, or Toxic Spikes, letting it support itself and or its team against annoying Pokemon like Chansey, or most commonly, Substitute, which ruins any attempt to play around Needle King with Prediction. With Substitute, you can't pivot in a faster Pokemon on a move it resists to threaten it out anymore. The safety of the sub means it's always going to blast whatever it's facing with the strongest move possible, which usually means a KO. But wait, what of that base 85 special attack? Super effective coverage is great, but you've got to have more than that. Well, that's where Needle King's amazing sheer force ability comes in, removing the second secondary effects of moves that have them, but giving them a massive boost in power. That's not all either, as Needle King gets even stronger with Life Orb, which it runs without drawback, as any move boosted by Sheer Force will not take Life Orb recoil. Thus, Needle King has amazing raw strength, ensuring even neutral targets get hit incredibly hard. Forget taking its Sludge Waves at all decently with Rotom Wash, for example, but with the huge number of Pokemon it hits super effectively, it becomes a one-hit KO machine. What makes Needle King especially threatening is that it has terrific defensive typing for an offensive Pokemon. It's resistant to Stealth Rock, immune to Thunder Wave and Toxic, and even absorbs Toxic Spikes upon switching in, which is massively helpful team support. It can't be worn down by Sandstorm, and it can take some actual attacking moves as well, most notably boasting an immunity to Volt Switch and resist to Moonblast. And so Nidoking has been one of the most feared wall breakers in OU for the last several generations it's been in. Clefable often vexes players because they don't understand why it takes so little damage from everything. Base 95 HP is good, but 90 special defense doesn't seem like it make it as bulky as it is. And that applies even more so to its 73 defense. How is it that a Pokemon with this defensive profile is so unkillable? Of course, the first answer is Magic Guard. It's easy to remain in pristine hit-taking condition when you don't have to worry about entry hazard or status damage. The second answer is Soft Boiled, making it even easier for Clefable to stay healthy. However, Clefable also does have to take actual hits, and that it does with Aplomb, demonstrating that those seemingly low stats actually have quite some heft to them. It helps that Clefable is far from passive. If it was an unthreatening blob a la something like Cresselia, it wouldn't matter that you can't immediately overwhelm it with damage, you just keep hitting it. However, Clefable's excellent move pull makes it quite threatening in its own right, which means you've got to hit it hard and do it quickly, and therein lies the issue. In most cases, Clefable's bulk gets the job done within the window you have to overwhelm 
overwhelm it without being ruined in return. Even many super effective hits like Bish Sharp and Extra Drill Iron Head aren't threatening it for a one hit KO. And Clefable can do some nasty stuff if you give it that opportunity too, which is quite difficult to avoid. The example of its bulk goes as far back as Gen 4, before it had the resistances of the fairy typing to bolster its defensive profile further. Before that, it was a normal type and had just about nothing in the way of useful resistances. It was neutral to everything and still devoured hits with ease. It then did the same things it did as a fairy type. It set up rocks, it spread thunder wave and knock off, it could threaten with calm mind and or its special coverage moves and maybe even recoil less life orb. It had all manner of superb utility in wish and encore and heal bell. In gen 8, it became renowned for how easily it passed wish to its teammates through teleport. Of course, one can't speak too highly about magic guard, which gave Clefable terrific utility and outlasting slower paced opponents while keeping it healthy enough to withstand hits from faster ones. This was the backbone of its viability as a staple in gens 4, 6, 7, and 8 OU. Magic guard was so good, it even gave normal type Clefable niches in the higher power metagames of gen 5 OU and gen 4 ubers. However, Clefable did occasionally use its other ability unaware in OU and ubers in both gen 6 and 8. It wasn't quite the same as its magic guard dominance, but it was so useful in its own right, especially with how scary Xerneas was. But as far as unaware Pokemon go, there was another. But before we get to it, we have to quickly rattle off some honorary mentions. First, despite its seemingly unimpressive stats, Needle Queen's outstanding defensive profile gave it an incredibly important place in Gen 4 OU. With its amazing Toxic Spikes absorption and fighting resistance, it alongside the fellow seemingly low stats lower tier Pokemon Clefable, which it so commonly partnered up with, completely changed the face of defense in the tier and forced offense to adapt in a major way. Second, several Pokemon with poor or unimpressive stat spreads have been launched to huge viability or even broke brokenness in OU by virtue of their abilities. Dugtrio and Gothitelle have brutal trapping capabilities, and Ninetales, Politone, and Pelipper set weather. Finally, Gastrodon has had a long time history in lower tiers, only to repeatedly show up and dominate OU, sometimes even making appearances in Ubers. Gastro's viability is often attached purely to Storm Drain's buff in Gen 5, which has made it as good as it has been for so long, but it also was an effective choice with the trick and knockoff blocking effect of Sticky Hold in Gen 4 OU. However, Gastrodon's base HP is way too high to consider it a true exemplar of this theorem, as opposed to This theorem's namesake is now synonymous with the unaware ability, especially given its fittingly content, vacant expression. But Quagsire was doing great things as far back as Generation 4 with its water absorb ability. Upon receiving recovery in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, it could finally make the most of its outstanding, unique defensive typing. It was an amazing water type answer that shrugged off the obligatory ice coverage with ease, giving it an excellent niche in OU, shrugging off Starmie, Suicune, and Gyarados alike. It was also a great answer to several other threats like Zapdos, Heatran, Tyranitar, and many variants of Jirachi. Water Absorb Quagsire wasn't just good in OU either. It worked beautifully in Ubers, where it blanked none other than King Kyogre, immune to its water stab, immune to thunder, and just specially bulky enough to shrug off even ice beams. What if Kyogre started calm minding? Well then Quagsire would encore it and that be that. Gen 5 buffing Storm Drain to include a water immunity meant Water Absorb Quagsire was now outclassed by Gastrodon and OU and Ubers alike. But that was just fine, as Gen 5 had also bestowed upon Quag its now signature ability, Unaware. It switched over to physical defense and effortlessly sat on the high-powered physical attackers running through the rest of OU. Even the terrifying likes of Sword Snacks Extra Drill and Dragon Dash Dragonite wouldn't get past Quag, who ignored their boosts and devoured their attacks with ease. It could even help against the likes of the famed Stall Killer, Calm Mind Reuniclus. In saving off such monstrous boosting sweepers, Quagsire gave life to Stall teams, which struggled to withstand the enormous power Gen 5 had brought with it, boosting their viability to the point where whether it was sand or rain stall, defense anchored by Quagsire was among the most reliable team styles in the game. Quagsire pulled this same trick in Gen 6 OU. Pokemon like Bisharp and Mega Charizard X would ordinarily threaten nearly any defensive squad, but with Quagsire around, they were basically non-factors. Quagsire was a fixture on dedicated stall teams throughout the generation for this reason. Quagsire was so good at doing this job that some players even bemoaned its efficiency, claiming that it could be unreasonably difficult to break 
breakthrough stall when boosting wasn't an option. In X and Y Ubers, Quagsire also had a niche. It walled none other than extreme killer Arceus. Turns out being the god of Pokemon has no effect on those who are ignorant. Quagsire wasn't as much of a stall staple in Gen 7 OU, but it still had its place. But this was nothing compared to Gen 8 Ubers. Zacian Crown tore through everything in sight with absurd speed and attack, with the latter receiving a plus one boost whenever it switched in. Who do you call when there's a boosting threat? None other than Quagsire, of course. It ignored the boost and just barely avoided a two-hit KO, making it one of the most reliable checks to one of the most impossible to stop Pokemon in history again. This is the real reason Quagsire is number one on this list and has the theorem named after it. In three different generations, it has stifled the most dangerous Pokemon in the game. And that's it. Of course, stats are important. Even though Quagsire and Clefable aren't Giratina tier bulky, they still are great hit takers. However, it's always great to see that you don't need to have obscenely high stats in order to succeed, or even to have multiple very good stats. This list is comprised of Pokemon who don't break even base 100 in a single stat, with the exception of Nidoking and the attack stat it doesn't use. It's just a matter of the right traits coming together. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and in the comments, I want to know, what do you think about this theorem? Were there any Pokemon you thought should have been on this list? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments, and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.